While watching the online lectures, be sure to use the attached packet to take notes on. You'll find the link for the packet here at the title page for each chapter. Click on it, then print out the packet. These gray boxes in the online lectures refer to the slides and pages in the packet. In this online lecture, we're going to see how molecular orbital theory helps us in organic chemistry. To show you this, I have to first explain what molecular orbital theory is and how it works. We're going to see that we can use it to help us understand how molecules bond and also how molecules behave. So let's start with a simple example. Let's start with the hydrogen atom here. Remember, he's number one on the periodic table. And we also learned before in a previous online lecture that his electronic configuration is simply 1s1. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to use molecular orbital theory to understand the H2 molecule better. We're going to get a better understanding of the molecule and the bond between the two hydrogens as well. So first, let's represent his Lewis dot structure. Here it is, H2. It has one single sigma bond between the two hydrogens. Now, one way to conceptualize this single bond right here is think about this. Each hydrogen, remember, has one electron and a 1s orbital like this. So we can conceptualize this bond as saying that it is simply an overlap between the two s orbitals of each hydrogen. And by definition, a head-on overlap of two orbitals is called a sigma bond. This is one way molecular orbital theory explains bonding. What you see in front of you, what we created here, is what's called a molecular orbital. And remember what that means. An orbital is a region in space where we can expect to find an electron. So this structure in front of us is telling us that the two electrons in this molecule could be anywhere in the vicinity of this overall molecular orbital. So that means these two electrons could be here, they could be here, here, or here, anywhere within the combined orbital of these two s orbitals. Think about that. That's a better understanding of the H2 molecule. Because if you think about just the Lewis dot structure, you might get the impression that the electrons could only be between each hydrogen. But we can see through molecular orbital theory that that's not true. The electrons simply have more room to run. So this is one way to think about bonding in molecular orbital theory. However, molecular orbital theory also helps us think about bonds in another sense. And in order to understand that, we have to first learn the concept of wave-particle duality. This is something we should have learned in a general chemistry class. But let me remind you of the concept. First, a quick little review about waves. Remember, if you have two waves, let's say like this, and they meet up at the same time, same place, then they had a term for that. It was called constructive interference, which means you'd get a wave that's two times as big. What happens is simply the amplitudes of these waves are additive. But remember, this is not the only way that two waves can overlap. You can also have, for instance, a wave pointing up and one pointing down, and when they overlap, what you end up getting is zero wave displacement, or a flat line. And remember, this was called destructive interference. Now, here's the thing. The important truth about wave-particle duality is simply this, that we need to know that matter could be considered both wave and particle. Now, this is very profound to think about matter as both wave and particle. It's easy to think of matter as being particle-like, but how could matter be wave-like? Well, the truth is, it is. And we can't really wrap our intellect around that. So we're going to see how molecular orbital theory helps us understand it to the best that we can. So, for instance, if matter is both wave and particle, then we can consider electrons as both a particle and we could think of them as waves. What does that mean? Well, this is how it's going to work in molecular orbital theory. If we could think of electrons as waves, then imagine two electrons as waves meeting up constructively, you would get, again, a plus two amplitude wave. In molecular orbital theory, if two electrons have the same wave phase, then they're going to call that bonding. So constructive interference 
now becomes bonding. And molecular orbital theory also has a way of conceptualizing destructive interference. Again, if you think of electrons as waves, and these two electrons meet up and they happen to be in opposite phase, then we get zero wave displacement, destructive interference, but in molecular orbital theory, we're going to call this anti-bonding. So now that we understand this, let's look at another way to think about the H2 molecule. Again, remember, it involves a H atom with his 1s electron bonding with another H atom with his 1s electron. In this case, we're going to think of the electrons as waves instead of particles. Which means this, remember, if these electrons are waves, they can come together constructively. That's one possibility. If they do, we would call that the sigma bonding molecular orbital. But we also saw the other possibility. These two electrons as waves could meet up destructively, and that would be called the sigma star antibonding molecular orbital. Now, why does this diagram look the way it does? Well, remember, just like in electronic configuration, we like to list our orbitals by increasing energy, with the lower ones being lower energy and the higher placed ones being higher energy. So what this chart is reminding us of is that the sigma bonding molecular orbital is lower energy than the sigma star anti-bonding molecular orbital, and the 1s atomic orbitals are lower energy than the sigma star antibonding molecular orbitals, but higher energy than the sigma bonding molecular orbital. However, we're not finished yet. What we have to do is fill in the central part of this diagram. Well, remember, each hydrogen has one electron, so simply what we do is we fill in the electrons to the central part of this diagram, and of course we follow the Aufbau principle, which means we fill in lower energy orbitals first and work our way up to higher energy orbitals. So this one electron would first go into this sigma bonding molecular orbital, and this electron over here we can double up and he would also be in a sigma bonding molecular orbital. Now, here's the thing we need to accept. What you see here in front of you is another way to conceptualize the H2 molecule meaning we could represent the H2 molecule as a Lewis dot structure. We could represent the H2 molecule as two s orbitals overlapping, and this now then becomes a third way. And if this way seems kind of abstract, well, of course it is. Remember, we're treating electrons as waves when we think of the H2 molecule this way. And since we can't really conceptualize that, this becomes the best way that we can try to understand the H2 molecule when treating electrons as waves. Now let's pause very quick for some vocab terms here. The sigma bonding molecular orbital in this example could also be termed the HOMO, which stands for highest occupied molecular orbital. What this term means is simply the sigma bonding molecular orbital in this particular diagram happens to be the highest orbital that has or is occupied by electrons. This makes the sigma antibonding molecular orbital the LUMO, which means the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Later on in organic chemistry, these charts get more complicated and have more bonding and antibonding molecular orbitals and there will always be orbitals that are the highest in the chart that are going to be occupied by electrons, making those orbitals the HOMO. And there will always be orbitals that are not occupied by electrons, and the lowest level one in that diagram would be termed the LUMO. We'll learn in another online lecture later on why this is so important to focus on these particular orbitals. Now there's something else I want to show you here you can kind of almost combine the two ways of thinking about bonding together in a diagram that looks like this. Remember, if the two H atoms come together, one way they could come together is through the sigma bond, and that is, again, if the electrons are in the same phase. But we also saw the two electrons could meet up as waves in the opposite direction, and that would cause this sigma antibond. Thinking about the H2 molecule this way, almost considers both electrons as particles and technically as waves. We're going to be looking at bonds this way a lot in organic chemistry. 
Now, what does this help us understand? Why do we need to understand that electrons are both wave and particle? Well, let me give you an example here. There are times when we want to understand how a particular molecule might behave. The explanation might lie in treating electrons as particle, and sometimes other explanations will involve treating electrons as waves. So for instance, let's say you have H2 liquid. Remember, H2 normally likes to exist as a gas. And remember why that's so? Well, let's pretend we're taking a magnified view at this H2 liquid. If H2 is existing as a liquid, it means that the molecules are being held together by intermolecular forces. However, that seems improbable because the H2 molecule has no polarity. So there simply shouldn't be any attraction between two H2 molecules. Yet H2 in liquid form does exist at certain temperatures and pressures. The question is, how could this be possible? Well, the explanation here involves us treating electrons as particles. For instance, remember, we know that the H2 molecule looks like this. And remember, the purple spheres here represent the molecular orbital, which means it's possible for two electrons to technically be right here. If that happens by random chance, then notice that would make this side of the molecule partially negative and this side of the molecule partially positive. And here's the thing, imagine if you had a beaker of liquefied H2. Let's say you have a mole of it. That means that you have 6.02 times 10 to the 23 H2 molecules. That's a lot of molecules, which means the chances of at least one of the molecules adopting this conformation that you see in front of you, it is technically possible. And think about the aftermath of that. What would happen to the H2 molecule next to him? Remember, like charges repel. So the electrons in this molecular orbital would move over to also to the right. That again would cause a partially negative charge here on the molecule and a partially positive charge here. If this happens, now notice we have an interaction here. The negative part of the left-hand side H2 molecule would be attracted to the positive part of the right-hand H2 molecule. This would set off a chain reaction, basically, in the liquefied H2, meaning even the next H2 molecule would have his electrons repelled to the other side, causing him to be partially negative on the right, partially positive on the left, and again, therefore, connecting these two molecules. So, if we treat electrons as particles, molecular orbital theory tells us that it is possible to make H2 slightly polar, and this explains how two H2 molecules can actually be attracted to each other. However, look at this situation right here. Let's again say we take our H2 liquid and we take some kind of light source here and we shine the light through the liquid. Remember, light acts as a wave and that light can actually penetrate the liquid and go right through it. And let's say the light happens to have a certain frequency, and let's call it frequency 1. But here's the reality. Let's say that our light source, we have the ability to change the frequency of the light that it shines. And we start to shine light with certain frequencies at this H2 liquid. And as we keep changing the frequencies, this is what would happen. Eventually, we would get to a certain frequency of light that would actually be absorbed by the liquid and therefore not go through it. Let's call that particular frequency F2. Now, here's the thing. What if someone asks you, why does the H2 liquid absorb light at a certain frequency and not other frequencies? Well, what we're going to see here is to answer that question, we need to think of electrons as waves. So let me prove that to you. If you remember from physics or general chemistry, there was an equation that said the energy due to light is equal to H, Planck's constant, times frequency. So basically what this means, different frequencies of light correspond to different amounts of energy. So again, let's conceptualize electrons as waves, which means we would represent the H2 molecule with our molecular orbital description right here. And what we can say here is that when we shine light with a certain frequency, that is F2, the reason why the light is absorbed 
is because it simply takes one of these electrons here and knocks it up to a higher energy molecular orbital, the sigma star anti-bonding molecular orbital. Remember, energy increases as you go up on this chart, and it just so happens to be that this difference in energy right here is a certain fixed value. That difference in energy would have to correspond to a certain specific frequency, and in this case, that frequency would be the F2 frequency. So notice, we're explaining how this molecule behaves, again, by treating electrons as waves. So this is why wave-particle duality is so important. So in summary here, we could think of, again, electrons as particles. That means that they could come together in two ways. That is via a sigma bond or an anti-sigma bond. And we could also think of the H2 molecule as this diagram right here if we think of electrons as waves. So let's look at a sample problem here. Give the molecular orbital diagram for the H2 plus molecule. Well, we would start out with our same arrangement right here. And again, we'd fill in the central part of this diagram with the two electrons that we have available. And what we have right here is the molecular orbital diagram for the H2 molecule in its neutral form. However, this problem wants H2 plus which means this molecule is missing one electron. So all you would do is remove one of these electrons from the molecular orbitals. And in this case, it doesn't matter which one. I'm going to take away the right-hand one, which means this becomes the molecular orbital diagram for the H2 plus molecule.